Hello, everybody. Welcome to the State of Mind Mental Health Podcast, where we bring you the stories underneath the slogans. In this episode, we discuss the emergence of the feminine energy in our society and how that impacts the workplace, our family dynamics and gender roles, and corporate structures. I interview two accomplished women who share their personal transformations and stories of leaving the corporate world and starting their own businesses. And I think they share deep and beautiful insights that are not discussed very often in the mainstream discourse around uh, our gender differences and how that influences our lives. And the first person you'll hear is Michelle Moore. She is the founder of Mind Equity Inc. And the second person I interview is Kareen Sarugian. She is an intuitive coach, a healer, and a kundalini yoga instructor. We talk about parenting, we talk about mindfulness, we talk about spirituality, and we talk about gender in the workplace. And I think you will learn a lot from this episode. I think that we touch on some topics that I don't hear often in, again, in the, in the common discourse out there. Last but not least, this podcast is brought to you by Starts With Me, a consultancy specializing in K-12 education and workplace mental health. Without further ado, I bring you Michelle Moore and Kareen Saruji. Thanks for having me. So my name is yeah. Michelle Moore. And I'm founder of Mind Equity Inc. I'm a management consultant helping innovative organizations increase workforce well being and productivity. So I do this through a holistic five step approach around one deep work, asking ourselves as a team and as individuals how much undistracted focused work do we actually need to be doing? Two, team culture. And then also three, what's our individual and collective body wisdom that we can tap into? And then the last two are what we all know and love, digital tools and our physical and our virtual spaces. So some of the personal experiences that led me to do this work, which is really about attention and harnessing attention, is a personal childhood story about a horse and a violin. So from the age of three to 16, I implemented my dad's dream that I would be a concert violinist. So I didn't really want to do this. Um, I played detached from my body, just in my head. And believe it or not, you're, it's possible to play technically without using your heart or really any um, intention to play well. Um, but at this time, horses were my escape and got me out of my head and back in my body. And so in keeping with your theme, Mike, the, the horse here is really the feminine energy and the violin is the masculine energy. And you'll kind of see how that threads through um, with some, some more detail. But what really happened, you know, in this, this horse and violin dynamic until the age of 16, it set a trajectory in my career. And it made me kind of understand that I would be rewarded for brain power. And so I went into consulting. I had a type A personality. I had stress. I had over busyness. I had lots of international tragedy, uh, not tragedy. I'd love to edit that out. I had lots of international travel and this could have resulted in burnout but luckily i had discovered yoga and meditation after the horses really in my 20s and thus i had practices in this consulting career to get back in my body which i think prevented a, a real meltdown and in the last 10 years working in canada with technology teams i really began to notice the erosion of my ability to focus my own attention at work, despite these practices. So I sort of had compartmentalized yoga and meditation practice and movement practice as a thing outside of work. And then at work, again, I was busy, distracted and losing my ability to focus. And so at the same time, noticing this in myself, I was witnessing a general decline in well-being and productivity in these technology teams that I was working with. And so I attribute this to the pace of life and change continuing to increase 
and open office spaces proliferating and this increase in digital tools in every corner of our lives. And I realized a more holistic solution to focusing my attention was really needed. So continuing with this body wisdom practice that I knew and was doing, but also changing my relationship with these four other factors that impact our ability to focus, which I mentioned before, like deep work, culture, tools, and space. And that's how I got here today. Can you just tell me a bit, um, what, what does it look like when, so you said you noticed your practices for presencing, et cetera, um, were detached from what was going on at work? And you, yeah. like, how did that come about? And then how did you, like, bring them back together or something like that? And, and what did it look like in other people as the, do you think it's connected to, to the rise of all the gadgets and all the, et cetera? Like I do. Tools uh, and da, 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 da. So, so yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, so growing up in the consulting world, you know, in my 20s, 30s, and 40s. For sure, yoga and meditation was something you didn't even talk about with your colleagues that you did that, right? And so at that, and, and those, you know, 30 <laughs> years ago, that was, that was really a separate thing. You did that separately at somewhere else, and you didn't bring that into the workplace. At the end of my tenure with PricewaterhouseCoopers, I actually brought corporate yoga, or I brought yoga into the space. I, I was a, an equity partner. I had some influence, and I actually convinced them to hire my own yoga teacher to come in and teach wow. at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And this is in Moscow, Russia. I spent 15 years with PwC in Moscow, and that's, that's a, a hugely masculine environment. And so, so uh, one of my legacies is I left <laughs> yoga at PwC Russia when I, when I moved to Canada. Um, so at that time, it was totally separate. And then when I moved to Canada and sort of got more into the, the social entrepreneurship space where people are more open in general and people wanted to know more about who you were as a whole person, it became more comfortable to speak about these things. But still, 10 years ago, I don't recall there being yet yoga and meditation in the office. It was spoken about and you knew people who did it, but you really didn't do it together. And so in 2014, though, I discovered... Theory U at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, which is a management consulting practices practice that or framework for systems change that infuses kind of standard in my mind standard management consulting with consciousness practice, presencing, and embodiment practice. So this was the first time in my life I had seen a legit consulting practice coming out of MIT, no less, that said consciousness is important, intention and attention are important. So that, so I decided to become trained in that and, and I'm a practitioner of that since 2014. And that enabled me to begin to sneak that into my consulting with technology companies in Canada. So it was a very slow process. So I would say only, it's been only six years that I've even been comfortable saying, okay, let's do some of this sense and respond stuff for innovation or systems change versus just the masculine predict and control, right? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, sorry, long answer, but I think- No, no, it's lovely, yeah. that's lovely, yeah. And, so, and you, are, you're, you are certified to teach MBSR, is that right? No, I'm not an MBSR teacher. So I am MBSR trained, but just for myself. What I am it, a okay. teacher of is social presencing, the embodiment okay. practice that comes out of MIT. Right on. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. On to Corrine. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself, please? Of course. So my and everything, you know, that what's led you here and et cetera. Absolutely. Mike, thanks for having us. This is so much fun. Um, and it's one of my favorite topics to, to talk about. So <laughs> I'm an intuitive coach, a healer, and a kundalini yoga teacher. And I help people awaken to see the beauty and magic of life. So I help people clear and release any limiting beliefs, any um, mindset pro issues or uh, traumas that are holding them back from living the magical life that they're meant to live. Um, so I have a 
four-step signature process that I use, which is clearing your beliefs, um, awaken the, the love within yourself, uh, embodying that playful you, and then eventually awaken your magic. So I currently work with um, individual clients within the corporate world. I work with companies like Stantec and Google um, and in the school system through the Youth Wellness Network to teach um, yogic practices, breath work, mindfulness, emotional awareness. So different levels of, of, of practices and techniques you can use to really center yourself and to really awaken that, that, that magic within all of us. So it's interesting because what very similar to Michelle, what led me to this is I haven't been doing this my whole life. So I started out as a journalist. <laughs> I studied journalism. That's my, uh, that's my university degree. Um, I worked as a journalist for a couple of years and then moved on to uh, PR event management and communication, social media. And I did that for a while. Um, I thought my whole life, I thought that what I was good at was what I was meant to be doing. And then I had a massive spiritual awakening uh, when I had my first child, uh, my daughter, and something in me just shifted. Something in me shifted. And I looked at my entire life. I did a whole assessment of my life and I went, well, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel right. This isn't a line. It's almost felt like I was living this like illusion of a life. I was living somebody else's life and that wasn't me. It was like this conditioned self that was, you know, that told me to go to university, uh, get married, have children, buy a house with a white picket fence. <laughs> like I, I just saw this illusion for what it was. And then I started shifting my life and turning my life around. And uh, shortly before I had uh, kids, actually, I, um, I had a massive breakdown. I had a severe anxiety attack, a massive depression. On the surface, in theory, my life looked perfect. I had a great husband. I was living uh, in a very nice home. I was making great money. I was moving up the corporate ladder. Um, I had incredible friends, great supportive family. Everything in theory was beautiful, but I was just empty inside everything felt very misaligned. So I had a yoga teacher friend of mine invite me to a mindfulness a Vipassana retreat for a weekend. It was a silent retreat. And I'm very much like Michelle, very type A, uh, Leo fire sign. So I'm like silent for an entire weekend, sitting down and meditating. I don't think so. That is not me. I cannot do this. I cannot meditate. I tried for years to meditate. It was not for me. And finally she convinced me and that, that weekend changed my life. Uh, the first day I was cursing the day I walked into that building. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. This is useless. Second day, I was crying, bawling my eyes out. I had pain all over my body. And when I went to see the teacher, uh, he said, yeah, he's like, you're, you're releasing emotional pain. You have pent up emotional pain and trauma from childhood that you've been holding onto for so long because you've just been numbing and numbing and numbing. And it's been accumulating layers and layers of this pain has been accumulating for years. Uh, and he said, keep doing your practice. The next day, you'll feel better. And the next day I did, the pain was completely gone. Uh, I remember going home that night and walking into my bathroom and going, I love this bathroom. Going into my bedroom, I love this bedroom. Like my husband, my, my then husband, I was like, I love you and I love my life and I love everybody. It was just this realization that my entire life I'd been just like in that masculine energy of go, 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 rush, 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 do, 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 perform, produce. And my sense of self-worth came um, it was in, in relation to the amount I produced, which is what the corporate world, which is what, you know, uh, the assembly line mentality back in the day has kind of washed over into our day to day. But we're coming to this awareness that this kind of pattern and this kind of behavior, this mass overly masculine behavior is not the solution. That's what leads to stress. That's what leads to anxiety and depression and that imbalance. It's all about the imbalance, right? So shortly after I started um, taking yoga classes, uh, meditating more, and just my life completely changed around. Um, and a couple of years ago, I had another massive awakening and I left the corporate world. I was working in marketing and PR at an agency. It was a very abusive environment. So I left that. I left my marriage. I left, I left every, I just, I call it, in what I teach, I call it shedding. So it's not like you're losing. I literally shed layers and, and sort of the skin that wasn't mine to sort of emerge into who I truly am, that balanced version of myself. So yeah, my story, part of my story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's like, I love like, I always get goosebumps in a sense, like when I hear these, yeah, it was the same with when Michelle's describing that process. So I, uh, 
I'm curious, you had, did you go to the yoga retreat before or after the first sort of meltdown that you said you had? After. Yeah, after, after. Okay. And, and, and the self, cause when you described like, you're like, I took stock of everything that I was doing, you know, da da da. Did you just do that on your own or was somebody help you with that? Cause I find a lot of times people, I, that's a really hard thing to just come to on your own in some sense. So I'm just curious how you did that. Um, and yeah, like what did that look like sort of um, in practice? I did You said, sorry, last question, sorry, was is that before you left the corporate job? The self-assessment, the, so it was like uh, yoga retreat, no, breakdown, yoga retreat, taking stock of everything, then leaving the corporate? So, I went to, I had the, uh, the breakdown, the meltdown, yeah. and then I yeah. went to the mindfulness retreat that completely changed my life. And then when I came back, I still worked in the corporate world. It didn't make me okay. realize that the job was wrong for me. Like it wasn't, that okay. realization wasn't there. I, what I realized is that I wasn't embracing the moments. I was rushing through life. I was being very masculine in, in, in the way I was approaching life. So it actually made my job back then much more enjoyable. I was working as a marketing communications manager for a toy company. And it, it just made it so much more fun because I started playing with, um, with everything, not taking everything seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, my reactions changed. So the situation didn't change. The company was still the same, was still very much uh, you know, draining um, and very masculine energy. But because I had changed, my response and my reaction had changed. So I only left that job when um, I gave birth to my first child. So on maternity leave, that's when I had my other awakening. And I was like, oh, I'm not going back. I cannot go back. Um, and I started my own business back then, but it was an e-commerce uh, site. I was doing different things. I was trying different things. It's like I spent my whole life sort of dabbling in different areas saying, oh, is this for me? No, is this for me? Let me try this. Let me try this until I got to the point where I'm like, oh, well, this is my purpose. This is what I'm meant to be doing. But yeah, it wasn't, um, it was a long journey. And, and to answer your question, whether I did it alone, I did do it alone. Uh, do I recommend it? Absolutely not. Uh, it was so much harder, uh, so much harder, so much more challenging. I suffered through it. It was brutal. Um, I went through some very difficult times and I, I've always had that type of personality that's like, I can do it myself. I can figure it out. I will Google it, <laughs> you know, I will figure it out. I'm resourceful. I can do this Leo energy in me. Um, but if, you know, in, in retrospect, if I look back, I wish I had had the help. Uh, not that I have any regrets because everything I did for myself, everything I worked on because I went through the process in detail on my, and I practiced everything on myself, I was able to build this program and I'm able to help others do the same right now because I've suffered through it. I, my philosophy is that, yeah, pain is inevitable. You're going to feel pain, but you don't have to suffer through it. It's optional, fully optional. Yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. Um, so, the, okay. So to move into this idea of the growth of the feminine energy in our workplace, but also in society in general, um, can we first like clarify that energy and gender, or when we say feminine energy, it doesn't mean biological female or gendered female. Um, and maybe that example you gave of the, the future's female shirt is like kind of like a good talking point because it kind of can distinguish between this assumption we have of feminine energy and biological female biological sex female and maybe so uh, michelle can you maybe start and just explain how you see those two things um and maybe an example of what they might look like in your life or just in the general context yeah um so I think as a child with this horse and violin dynamic and, and sort of the father figure wanting me to play the violin, uh, I didn't know that there were these two dynamics of feminine and masculine energy. But when I look back on that experience, I realize that my, you know, kind of being forced to play the violin, I 
as a smart human, as an intuitive human, right? Just as an intuitive human, I found a way to balance that masculine energy and that striving towards doing something well, even though I really didn't want to do it. I found the horse, right? I found the female body. I found the connection to earth. Um, and, and so I feel like every human being has that innate wisdom to differing degrees about finding balance, but I struggled with that balance. So, so one, there's a story of my mother told me that they thought that I was going to be a boy when I was in the womb. So they had actually selected my name and my name was going to be Eric. And then out came, you know, a, a girl and I was renamed Michelle. And so somehow maybe there was a projection of me being male like, and, and then I was always rewarded for acting like a boy. I was a tomboy. I didn't wear dresses. I climbed trees. Then in career, you know, doing an MBA and going to PricewaterhouseCoopers, I was rewarded for acting like a man. So I think I became much more masculine. And I never thought that I would want a child or anything. Like I didn't, I suppressed the mother. I suppressed all this stuff, but I was rewarded for this in, in my job. So I, no one was telling me, Michelle, you're, you know, you're too much mass, you've got too much masculine energy or anything like that. And I didn't realize it until, until I left PricewaterhouseCoopers and, and became independent, right? Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it's only reflecting back on these things, you know, starting with, with, you know, six or seven years ago that I realize what these energies were and are in me and how I continue to try to find balance, uh, but very intentionally now. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I always struggle with the balance in between when people are talking about topics or there's discourse around certain things without the person who's describing it, if they haven't experienced it internally in some sense, um, I don't know. I, like, I don't want to be uh, self-righteous in the sense of saying like, well, it's very hard for you to speak about this unless you have at least experienced it and you have the context from the personal perspective um, because there's a lot of that going on, right? It's like, oh, look at me, I'm for this and I'm for that and waving my flag, but there's no internal reference point that's sort of rooted in a non-judgmental awareness, <laughs> you know, of like, there it is. Um, yeah, so maybe we can we can go more to that. And then, uh, oh, I lost. I had another question for you, but I'm trying to write it down so I don't forget because I am forgetful. Um, okay, so, Kareen, can you tell us a little bit about, God, I can't even remember the question specifically, but it was about how you're seeing, let me go back to it so I don't mess it up. Yeah, the, the growth of the feminine energy in the world um, and how it doesn't necessarily mean biological female, so to speak, and how that conversation is getting punted around in our uh, mainstream dialogue. It's very funny because Are, Michelle... Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, no. Michelle, a very similar story to yours. I was the biggest tomboy. <laughs> People look at me now and they're like, You're so feminine. I'm like, I wasn't, I was the biggest tomboy. I didn't even wear makeup till I was in my twenties. I think they forced me to wear makeup for my prom. I was like, what is this? Um, I, yeah, I've always been like physically stronger, uh, than the average tiny girl. Uh, and I used to help my dad like load up boxes and he used to call me his son. And I was like, his, I he didn't have a son back then. And like, I was his son. Um, and so all of these things, and it, it made me become more and more masculine in the corporate world. I had to be part of the boys club. I was one of the only senior managers who was female in that company. So I always had to try to wear the pants, right? So um, yeah, it's totally, I, I totally relate to, to Michelle's story. So to go back to the polarities, I think it's really important to, to understand them from an energetic standpoint too. So the way I like to describe them is like, think of the masculine energy as the tree trunk. So it's like the logic, the reasoning, the do, 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 go getting uh, 
productive, uh, scientific, logical mind. And then the female energy, the feminine energy is sort of like the branches and the leaves that kind of flows in the wind. So the female energy is very flowy, very intuitive, very free. So why balancing both energies is so important is that you need a bit of both. So in order to thrive as a um, grounded, happy, healthy human, we need to balance out those two polarities and those two polarities exist in everyone. So it's important to, to really emphasize on the fact that um, feminine does not mean girl or woman in gender terms and masculine doesn't mean male. Uh, it really is. We, everybody embodies those two polarities within themselves. So it's important to balance out those two energies and to know when you're off balance and, and to be able to center yourself, to come back to that balance. So yeah, that's kind of just the basic on what the, this, this means to me. So for me, it's always been sort of this journey of, of not going to the extreme of either, right? So you can be, yes, extremely masculine where you're go, go, go. You're not taking any time for yourself. You're not flowing. You're not free. And you're being very productive, but you're in that masculine stress, fight or flight response energy all the time. And then if you're too feminine, you're just so flowy that nothing gets done, <laughs> you know? it's like you're just waiting for things to happen you know there's just that's why it's so important to come to the center and balance the energies out um i had a, a friend of mine who put and i'm curious uh, and we'll go to michelle the and then we'll go back to green so there's there in the workplace for sure this sort of logical mind you know get it done like no time to do anything that's not productive is dominant. Um, I'm going to try to paraphrase because she put it so nicely. So we, as the growth of the feminine energy is coming or arising, it seems as if we're trying to, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to describe it. So if you guys can help me clarify, please. Um, it's as if we're, we're, saying yes we need a balance but we're gonna like shove this feminine energy down everybody's throat through a masculine lens right so it's not even it's almost like it's not i hate the word authentic but it's not i don't know what it is like it's not emerging in a sense that i think we would like to see it's as opposed it's just more masculine like i'm gonna beat you over the head with this feminine stick because it makes me feel better about myself and it makes it makes us collectively think we're doing the right thing or something like that so it was kind of i, I you know i wish she was here to help articulate it but does that make sense that question of like it yeah, still I can seems comment to be driven. Yeah, yeah, please. It's because there's still this um, tension between predict and control approaches in business, especially in strategy, but also in operating a business. So there's the, the habitual pre predict and control, which is that masculine en energy. And it's habitual. It's just systemic. It's just built into all of our systems, be it an education system or a corporation, right? It's just, it's just there. And people, men and women, don't even notice that they are just in the comfort zone of predict and control. And so the feminine energy that wants to come out is sense and respond. And I think where I saw this happen uh, and is happening really well is in the community of organizations that are moving towards self-management, self-organization. And that's the, the teal movement from reinventing organizations and Frederick Lelou, and that's the holacracy movement. So I ran a company, a benefit corporation in Canada a couple of years ago that I'm still on the board of, it's called Grantbook. And it began with the intention to be balanced with male and female energy. And it just began with re purposefully more, recruiting more females. And so I was recruited as the first female leader of that organization. And, and the two founders who are male really set an intention, let's get a female. And the, the, my successor is also a female. So, so that, that happened, but also Grant Book went to 
um, the strategy of becoming a self-organized flat um, organization. And that is a feminine methodology for organizing as well. And that's where these terms also come up. Let's Let's try to sense and respond into strategy, into service innovation, rather than predict and control. Let's, have a, let's not dump predict and control in the trash can. It's useful. We need it for you know, reporting to shareholders or, or anything else like that. But um, so for the first time, I, that was in 2016, I experienced two male co-founders using this sort of language with me and I was like, oh my gosh, that is, that is crazy. I can't believe where I've landed, right? Um, and, and I subsequently have been in touch with about 10 or 12 other uh, companies in Toronto that are part of a group called Brave Works that is a collection of leaders running organizations in this way. So it's a small cool. but powerful movement, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um... Okay, I'm going to ask now because I don't want to forget. The, in terms of the predict and control kind of thing being like habitual and woven into everything we do, I, I am reminded or I think about, um, you know, Yuval, Yuval Harari, the guy who wrote Sapiens? Yeah. So in some sense, that impulse in us or that wiring is... Um, well, this is my interpretation of his work, is somewhat part of our evolutionary ability to control our environment, to survive and to cultivate, blah, 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 blah. And so maybe as part of it, do you think now that we have done almost an, you know, a masterful job at manipulating the earth to make food and to keep ourselves safe and all these other things that I, I don't know, like that there's room now for a, the other type of energy or I don't even know how to think about that very well. Um, does that seem to make sense? And now, since we're not comfortable, I think for sure, we're not comfortable experiencing the more feminine energy of existence that the those who've benefited greatly from the predict and control there's almost like an underlying anxiety or insecurity with this if i don't control and uh, rule with an iron fist and everything's going to go to hell and i'm not going to be safe something like that can you maybe answer that and then we'll go to kareen yeah so i i agree with what you're saying and i think it's also about sense and respond is about getting comfort with uncertainty which I was never taught in business school. I was never taught to have comfort or even sense into uncertainty when I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and so that's a new skill set, sensing into the void, right? Um, but I think, especially in this pandemic, it's being forced upon us. It's like Mother Earth is telling us two things. She's telling us to pay attention to the climate and she's telling us uh, get okay with uncertainty because here it is. <laughs> and now she is using, Mother Earth is using predict and control on the whole, on all of humanity to get comfortable with uncertainty and begin to sense and respond. <laughs> that's my lens. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Getting some chills thinking about that. Oh, um, okay. Cool. Thank you. All right, Kareem. So what was the first question was how the, it seems, again, this is my interpretation, that we're using a masculine hammer to try and hammer a feminine nail into this like masculine, and I don't know, it's kind of weird. It's almost as if a silly analogy, maybe that's not a workplace one, but my kids are behaving in a way I don't like, and then I'm forcing them like I'm like oh like trying to pretend to be nice which would be my my masking of I'm pretending to be kind and sense and respond but I'm also like no you have to do it my way kind of thing like ah I don't know if that's a good analogy but it's like this weird tension between 
I'm, I, I'm pretending to let go and allow, um, but I'm really masking that in some control. I really like the predict and control kind of uh, framework. So I think anytime you force feed someone something, <laughs> <laughs> um, us humans have the tendency to subconsciously rebel against it. So think of a child who's you know being force fed a certain food item and they're gonna grow up to likely hate that food. <laughs> so um, we have this rebellious wild nature within us that's just innate. So anytime you force us to do something, like even us being forced to isolate right now has so many people up in arms. There's a whole rebellion happening for freedom and this and that. So anytime we are forced, it's never a good thing. It's never, it's counterproductive. It's counterproductive. So in the healing realm, um, I would ask a client, for example, if who, who's too masculine, I would ask them, what are your masculine wounds? So it's really about what is it about the masculine energy that has you grasping onto it, not wanting to let go? So I'm all about really getting to the root of the problem. So why is it that you're in your masculine? Where does this come from? What is the source? Your mother was very masculine. Ah, your spouse was very masculine. Okay, well, here it is. Your, the corporate world you worked in was very masculine. So you grew up in this masculine environment all throughout your childhood and in, well into your adult years, there's the root. So it's about healing the masculine aspects of someone that's going to naturally and organically bring in the feminine energy. That's when you'll embrace it instead of saying, okay, let's try to force this like, you know, circle peg, <laughs> circular peg into the square hole. Just force it in. It's going to fit in. That's a very masculine way, like you said, of getting someone to, to, to heal. But I like the gentle approach where you're like, okay, let's dig deep. Why is it that you're in this masculine energy? Why is it that you're so scared of the feminine energy? There is, if you dig deep, there's a root cause to all of that. And when you pluck the root cause, you'll be able to easily balance things out. It's not about, you know, bringing things in. The stuff is already in us. Like the polarity is already in us. We've just forgotten. We've just like allowed one polarity to dominate because we've been conditioned that way. So if you heal that polarity and that aspect of you, the other one will just kind of come and balance the other out. I love that you use the word reminder. Like all, I mean, a lot of the practices that I engage in it just, and one of my teachers is always like, just a reminder or just, coming back to what we sort of what's there that needs to be rediscovered. Do we think, uh, I, and I also like the, the wounds, because I think I remember in our conversation last time we talked about the, the um, when these energies get too in your face one way or the other, it's coming from trauma, right? Or, or it's coming from pain or from the suffering. Um, where... I don't, and I'm not aware of too much literature or even research, if there is, on this kind of stuff on, in some sense, up until, you could argue, maybe even up until World War II, we have been in perpetual warfare and famine and I just, you know, the list goes on of traumas. So perhaps, like, I don't know, are we in some sort of like realm of healing or something or or i don't know what it is like is that can you maybe speak to that maybe i don't know either one of you I, we have been going back and forth so maybe it's easier i defer the current on, on the healing okay piece. okay yeah, cool yeah. okay okay <laughs> um, i i just to sort of piggyback on what michelle was saying there's a massive collective awakening right now so us being sort of forced in this isolation this coronavirus the energy around it everything that's happening right now is for it is sort of forcing an awakening it's and people are not happy with it it's not but it's also encouraging people to do their own healing to go within their space so a lot of us have been sort of isolated on our own and we have no choice but to look at all of our wounds and there is, there's collective wounds. So a lot of us, especially if you're a sensitive or an empath, you are picking up on a lot of collective 
uh, heaviness right now, a lot of collective pain and a lot of collective energy. And then there's also our pain and our wounds. So yes, there's ancestral wounds that are coming out right now. So generational, um, goes back seven, seven, I believe it's seven generations that we're still sort of harboring in our system, in our cells right now. So um, if you want me to go fully spiritual and woo woo, there's also past lives. So our souls have come into this physical body and into, into this lifetime, but our souls have also lived many different li lifetimes before this one previously. So you're bringing on trauma from past lives. So not only do you have trauma from this lifetime, you have trauma from your ancestry. You have karma coming in from there. You also have tra trauma from past lives. <laughs> so you're like, obviously, we we are dealing with a lot of a lot of um, mental imbalances right now because of this. And if we're not aware of all this stuff, and we're not aware of of the work required, and we don't have the support system or um, the tools in our toolbox n required to heal through this, it's a very hard time for a lot of people right now for those people who don't have the tools. Yeah, definitely. So I'd love to um, comment on practice. Please. Um, so the comment on practice is, is around this, this body wisdom practice called social presencing, which is an embodiment practice that is used to harness creativity, innovation, and team or system transformation. It also has the side effect of well-being. So what I'm finding is I've never been asked to facilitate so much of this embodiment work as since the pandemic started, right? And this embodiment work is designed to do in a physical space. It's, it's some, you can do it online, but it's not designed for that and it's not optimal for that. But the reason why this is interesting is because the practice of social presencing, which is designed to use in organizations, but of course it's first the individual and then the collective, um, it brings balance to this habitual masculine top-down thinking. It brings balance to the analytical methods, you know, that I experienced most of my career. And it's an individual and organizational practice aligned with something called the feminine principle. And the feminine principle comes up in a bunch of wisdom traditions, but there's one, um, a Buddhist master referenced by one of my teachers, Rinpoche, and he taught that the feminine principle has an essence of space, like vast, vast space. So we practice sensing into space. So it's like it's an investigation of the open space and open mind, open heart of all human beings. And so this feminine principle invites us to discover how we can manifest more spaciousness and openness in ourselves and in our teams. Right, so when I look back on my experience in this big corporate tech consulting, I empathize too much with that masculine side. And so, and my clients did too, right? And so when I saw this practice through the Theory U, U lab in, in back in 2014 or 2015, I was fascinated that we can balance this analytical and cognitive thought, which is super important, I'm not saying get rid of it, but we can balance this by tapping into collective wisdom and we can get richer solutions and decisions and problem solving by incorporating a noticing of the space. So how this works in teams is we expand attention out to space and that's where creativity and new questions arise. So this may sound kind of out there, but it's actually very present and part of any human experience. Um, and so I can go into detail on, on how this actually uh, works in terms of what we're in relationship with, um, but, but I'll pause there for a second. Yeah, I think maybe it would be helpful because it goes back to the idea that when we, when people are trying to direct policy or even uh, guidelines, et cetera, if, if it's not coming from, at least in some sense, their own experience of that process, it just, it's, it's empty in a sense, or it's dry. And, and I think because it has to happen through consistent practice, at least for a certain amount of time, it's very difficult for maybe the, um, for more people to do it, basically. Um, 
and it is also very difficult to grasp because people try to use their cognitive processes to grasp it and it's just uh, you're never going to get it right so unless you're almost forced into letting go of that it's so difficult to get there so i i guess i struggle or i i'm how can we help maybe even people understand it a little bit more with their cognitive minds so that they might be more open to this letting go the word i wrote down as you were talking was do less and accomplish more which is such a paradoxical idea but it really is true in relationship to what you're saying and to this experience even i find I, I can't remember which one of you said it earlier but i was just reminded that every time i think i have to put more things on the to-do list and do more of them it just it's like i grind into a like you know you get so tense and nothing ends up happening very well and i always have to freaking remind myself that if i just stop for Christ's sakes, you know, and just sit in that and allow the space, as you say, to emerge. Then I can actually do something and I can think clearly. But that's a really hard lesson. As you also said, we're just raised to be so predict, control, do, 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 do. And then it just, I don't know. So maybe because even have like a, I have a leadership book here from, I don't know if you know Janice Marino. She wrote this book, Finding the Space to Lead. Oh, yeah, I have that too on my shelf. <laughs> and so she's a, she's a great example. Like, she kind of has a similar story to you. Like, she yeah. flew up the corporate ladder and was like, boom, 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 boom. And then she just kind of fell. I don't want to say fell apart, but she had that like moment. And then, kind of like Kareen, she went to a freaking meditation retreat and then everything changed. Yeah. But, um, but there's one know, dimension, yeah. yeah. There's there's yeah. one dimension in addition to space that that is part of the social presencing practice, which um, is that we're always in relationship with three bodies, a field, and a space. So the three bodies are planet Earth. We're always occupying a space on planet Earth, wherever we're sitting, right? Our feet are touching the ground somewhere, or our butts in a seat somewhere, right? Or we're walking. And so that's the first body is the earth body. The second body is simply our own individual human body. And the third body is the social body. And the social body in this case, on this Zoom, in this podcast, the three of us right now make up a social body. We can see it. We can see our faces. We can see what it looks like. We're looking at each other. And, and so that's the social body. The field, the social field is how we are in relationship. Um, based on history and based on why we're here today and all of that. So in, we're in relationship through an accelerator, right? And we're in relationship because we get together every once in a while and chat and share our, our experiences about growing our businesses. And so the social field is the invisible thing. So the three, bo the three bodies are visible, earth body, individual body, social body. Social field is relationship. It's invisible. You can always say that's Corinne would go into this. That's the energetic field that, that we all kind of sense, but nobody really wants to talk about. What's the energy of this team? What's the energy of this, you know, company or whatever, right? And then the final thing is the space. And space now has gotten really complicated because we're in sitting in physical spaces, all of us, right? I can see a plant. I can see Corinne has a tree. And, and so that's the physical space, but we're also in this nebulous thing called the virtual space. We're in a virtual space called Zoom. So we're dealing with two spaces now all of a sudden. So sensing into all of those relationships with those five things, so space being the feminine principle that Rinpoche talked about, but bodies I think are, are female too, mostly, right? Earth is female. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll again, I'll mm -hmm. stop there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Corinne, <laughs> can you speak to some of that? I don't have a specific question. Um, oh, maybe the do less and accomplish more and how it kind of relates to all these different. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I think um, a lot of us have grown up in that culture of do more, do more, do more. I think I see a lot of um, hustle. <laughs> that word has been such a trendy word the last couple of years that it just like kind of makes me cringe every time I see the word hustle or somebody says hustle and I kind of have to reframe that and say no align 
you need to align because just related to what you were saying earlier, Mike, when, you know, when you're in that productive mode of just doing, 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 and you get so drained and overwhelmed and it takes you longer to do something or you don't do things the right way because you're trying to multitask and do multiple things at the same time because you're trying to be efficient and productive. But oftentimes if you take that feminine step back, or you take a rest, you do some self-care, you come back to it, it'll actually take you less time to do it. Um, and or when you align, when you align with yourself, so when you center yourself, you're fully aligned with yourself, you're in that space of being calm and grounded and in a good mental space and a physical space, things would, will just flow naturally. So you don't have to force things. I'm not a fan of forcing anything. When you're trying to force something and it's too hard in that sense, um, it's just not aligned. Something's not right in the way you're trying. That's a very extreme masculine way of doing things is trying to force things to happen. You know, um, just take a step back, be feminine about it. So it's also knowing when to use your masculine energy and when to use your feminine energy. And this is very uh, applicable in a relationship situation too. So when you have two people together um, in a relationship being masculine, that's going to be a war. <laughs> that's going to be a war because they're going to try to one up each other because it's going to be a very competitive environment. But if there's a balance where if the gender male in, in the relationship or even two females, if one is more in the masculine energy and the other is kind of more, oh, I'll go into my feminine now, it like balances itself out. And that's what makes a good relationship. That's what makes a balanced relationship. There's no war happening and there's no competition mm -hmm. between. Them. Maybe, I, can you speak to that a little bit in, since we we're both in schools or we've done a lot of work with little people or even teens, because there it's a there's certainly a parallel between the schools and the workplace. Again, the the TDSB I'll just speak about that in this context. They have three pillars for student success: well-being, uh, equity, and achievement. I think they are, and so. Again, it's sort of this, hey, look at us. We have these wonderful ideas that we're all going to espouse or pretend that we live by. But then you get into a classroom or even the way that, anyway, it's just, it's the paradox of the human craziness. But without labeling it as such, it just becomes so kind of, you mentioned too about when particularly kids, I know me and my son is like this big time if we're told what to do and someone tries to control us, like shit, it's the fan. And so in class, now mindfulness in some sense is being used or even mental health, the language is being used as like a whack-a-mole. I remember this, a teacher of mine in one of my meditation groups, a teacher of mine, a teacher who was another participant in our meditation groups, use that analogy because she, she was teaching kindergarten. And so she's, she's, says the you know the schools are just using it as a whack-a-mole kids not paying attention whack might be more mindful whack 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 so it's kind of this i don't know like how do you see that in in classrooms or with students in in this approach of trying to be more balanced but it seems just like more more self-congratulatory nonsense if that's the right way to say it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely for a lot of um, school system or um, within the corporate world, it's, it's an image thing because it's trendy. Mindfulness is so trendy now. Look, we have a mindfulness program. I think first, if I look at it from a positive standpoint, at least they're doing something. It's better than doing nothing. At least these kids are getting exposed to the concept of mindfulness. But it's also important to, to address how it's being taught because if you're forcing mindfulness onto kids instead of making it more fun and playful instead of you know mindfulness isn't you know sitting down in like lotus pose and meditating because that's not what kids are going to be able to do even teens aren't able to sit down for more than a minute uh you know so if you bring it into you know you can be mindful while you're playing you can be mindful while you're washing the dishes you can be mindful there's techniques of, of embodying mindfulness that can be more fun that can be more playful so that it registers in their mind so if the school is bringing the right facilitators or the right program into the system it's up to that the facilitators to really train and teach not just the children but also the teachers and also 
going deeper, the parents, because ultimately the school system can only do so much. We put so much pressure on the school system, on these teachers who are already completely overwhelmed and, and overworked. Um, and what about the parents? Who's teaching the parents? Because what's happening, what I've seen happen, the dynamic is they learn all these beautiful things in the school system, in their classroom, and the teachers are doing their best to implement it. And I'm not saying this is the case for every school, but some of the schools I've seen are very gung ho on mindfulness and they're really putting in all of the effort. They're meditating themselves. They're setting an example for these kids. And then they go home and the parents aren't practicing mindfulness. So the kids are reverting back to what they were used to doing, right? So it all boils down to sort of leading by example. So the adults have to also lead by example because force feeding information to kids, you're not teaching from a space of authenticity. And I've, I've, I've trained teachers on this and I said, and they've asked me the question, well, how do I teach my, my students to be more mindful? And I said, my answer is be more mindful yourself. So practice mindfulness, practice what you preach because you're teaching from a space of authenticity. All you have to do is, it's all about energy. Like Michelle said, it's all about energy. If you have done your meditation in the morning and if you've been mindful that morning, you walk into your classroom, every single person in that classroom will feed off of your energy. It's the same in the corporate world. It's the same if you walk into a shopping mall, your energy will be felt everywhere around you. Your aura is everywhere around you. So it'll be felt. So practice from a, teach from a space of authenticity and that's really the key. So yeah, it does go down to the parents as well, especially now we're with them 24 seven. So if we're not doing <laughs> our work, like this is a reality now, if we're not doing <laughs> our work, oh, shit. If, if we're not doing our work, if we're not practicing, doing our own practice, these kids aren't learning anything, <laughs> you know, even through the online schooling system, they're not learning anything. Yeah, uh, that's a nice reminder. And I thank you for mentioning, you know, the teachers really are freaking asked to do so much. They get a bad rap for sure. And so I want to make sure I'm, I'm honoring my, my teachers out there. <laughs> Cause, I mean, even though some of them, you know, do questionable things, but yeah, they are, thank goodness for them. Um, okay, because well, we're getting, we got about, 20 minutes or so from our scheduled time. Uh, I want to ask, okay, I want to give you an example of what um, somebody I've, I actually was about to do a bunch of work for uh, in the corporate world prior to this whole fiasco. Um, we would have conversations around um, this sort of challenging stuff in the workplace for women approaching their 30s and they're they're in the masculine game this sort of climb the ladder do work be productive da 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 and so from my interpretation right there's this social discourse that we need more balance we meet, we need um, those things they're beneficial but at the same time it's it's we, we say that, but it has to happen within this rigid predict and control. I got to, that's such a good one, predict and control environment. And what their company is struggling with so much, because they're, you know, they're a high achieving, high whatever company, is that all, the, well, not all, a lot of their good female talent leaves when they approach that age. And so it's so weird, like, again, and forgive my sort of curious nature and thinking out loud, like, we're saying, okay, women, like, you, you should be climbing the corporate ladder too, or, or we should be forcing you into this situation, and that's good for you. Uh, and motherhood or something like your uh, evolved bodies should not be caring about motherhood or so like, I don't know, I'm trying to think out loud and get clear about it. And so forgive me for the jumbledness, but, but then when they, when women want to leave these jobs, then it's somehow the fault of the system. Like, 
I don't know. Are you getting what I'm trying to say in some sense? Like, how do we navigate that? And either whether it's like better maternity leave and paternity leave stuff, whether it's pay structures, like, I don't really know. But my real question is just this idea that, and sorry, lastly is, you can't say a word about that in this workplace. So you can't say, oh, well, maybe the women want to leave because they don't like working this much. And maybe becoming a mother is actually important to them. But if you say that, it's like, no, you're a freaking sexist or you're like, well, I don't even know the nonsense, but this person was like, no, you can't say that. And I was like, really? We can't even like have this discussion with your high achieving, high performing, gazillion dollar like consulting freaking ah okay i'm gonna stop trying to ramble on but hopefully that's somewhat clear um and i'm just curious if maybe michelle can you start and just reflect on <laughs> my little brain dump there yeah i'm just uh, i guess i'm reflecting on the difference between corporate and smaller companies so in my experience, the massive corporation has more of the habitual predict and control and lack of open mind, open heart, open will, right? There's, there's just a, a no one or, or few people are leading with that mindset of open heart, open mind, open will. And there's that issue of, is a leader showing vulnerability? Yes or no. Those few leaders that do exhibit vulnerability create psychological safety in their teams to say all of these things. And I don't know what the statistics are. I mean, vulnerability in leadership is a hot topic, right? Empathy, yeah. teaching empathy is a hot topic, right? I also teach the empathy toy or use it in, in facilitating. And so empathy is like a hot, a hot cake that you can you know, offer. Um, but it comes down to when you're still in a hierarchical organization, which most organizations on this planet are still hierarchical rather than self-organized. Um, and the hierarchical system goes against what we find in nature or in evolution, which those are sense and response systems. Those are flat systems and they self-organize. Whereas businesses and nonprofits as well are in this artificial hierarchical state that does not welcome, unless you have one of those vulnerable leaders uh, who's embraced Brene Brown, you know, and daring greatly and all that stuff, then I don't know that there's an answer, Mike, too, because until those people that have right now the power to hold the space, it's also this question about, do people know what holding space means, right? I, uh, most companies, I don't think, know what it means to hold space. It doesn't mean to lead a meeting, right? So, so until psychological safety is created, until more people with power show vulnerability, until more open mind, open heart, open will, enters the the how i think you were asking you know, how can we bring more balance into our organizations until those things happen until an intention is set to enable that openness that feminine energy of openness to come in until that attention is set and, and until attention is given to that in action and in behavior and in mindset it's going to be a long road. I mean, you can set quotas. Sure, that can help. Yeah, go ahead and start setting quotas, right, about how many women in leadership. But, but women don't like that. We don't like that. We don't want to be put in a position because there was a quota. Uh, so, so that also is back to forcing, right? But, um, yeah, I don't know if that was a concise thought, but that's kind of my response. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's helpful. Uh, before Karen answers, I'm just curious about the – and I, this is none of our expertise, so I don't want to go down this hole, but the terms of the hierarchical stuff, um, because in some sense, like hierarchies are part of our, as far as I understand, our, part of, our, of nature and of evolution. So I don't know where the balance is between the, as you sense, like the response, maybe it's both, like, I don't know. 
because as far as I understand it, like in animal tribes and in animal troops or whatever they are, like there is somewhat of a hierarchy there, but at the same time, it's not, it's almost like it comes from the sense and response as opposed to, is that? Uh, it's based on survival or? and not based on okay. um, power, yeah. on, on attaining more and more power. That would right. be how, like right. animals right. don't right. try to get powerful because <laughs> they have right, goals, right, right. right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, whereas people do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's super helpful. Oh my God. That I just like had this burst of energy as you said that. So can you say that again? It's, 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 uh, can you say that again? Sorry. The first part of that. About the power? It comes out, yeah. Like it, it comes, oh, survival. You said it comes out. Yeah. Of yeah. So, survival, so that right? hierarchy, because physically, yeah. like if you look at a lion, yeah. what are they called? Lion? They're not called tribes. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 lion, no, a uh, pack, a pack. A okay. lion pack, yeah, yeah. yeah the the yeah. male is the protector, right? right. Because the male right. is stronger, is physically stronger yeah. and was just simply evolutionarily created sure. that way. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's for survival. Mm -hmm. um, it's right. not, I don't think the male lion really has an ego. Yeah, right, or it's not like, yeah, okay. And That's then if great. you look That's at system, yeah. if you look at hierarchy in nature, even if you look at uh -huh. drawings, like um, the, the hierarchy is generally not linear or top down. It tends to be more circular or spiral or yeah. Yeah, cool. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Doreen, <laughs> where do we go from here? Oh yeah. The, maybe the thing about, actually you said you had your first, uh, awakening after your first child was born. So maybe that's a good example of that playing out. Of, of what exactly? Sorry, do you want to- I'm sorry, of being like, yeah, I, so because I mentioned like in this high performing work environments, there's yes. a competing message, right? Of like, women's got to climb the ladder, they got to be on top. And then, but it's like, well, they're also, and I, I think it's um, Eckhart Tolle who talks about women because of your bodies are closer to the essence of being and etc um and so yeah it's like you were saying again it's like this masculine stance of yeah let's bring uh, make everything equal but then you have to do it through the masculine like landscape and if you want to go off and have kids then like you're not being a good masculine freaking person or whatever i don't know yeah. And I think in my situation, I didn't go into detail uh, with what happened with this company I was working at. I was there for about four years and I had climbed the corporate ladder. I was performing really well. Great, you know, feedback from managers. I had a team of people working. It was great. I had every, you know, my plan was to go back after maternity leave. Um, and I held on to this baby at, when she was born. I was like, I don't know if I can go back. Something just w during that awakening, um, I was this, you know, go getting, uh, go getter, ambitious, uh, wanting to to move up to VP and then run an entire department. I had all these dreams and ambitions to to um, to grow within the corporate space. And then this baby I was holding was like telling me this was not my destiny. This was not my purpose, right? So that was like my first awakening. But what's interesting with what happened is I wasn't listening to my intuition. I wanted to go back. And near the end of my maternity leave, I was consulting for them because they wanted me to come back a little bit early and I didn't want to leave my child. So I said, well, I can consult for you guys. I can come in once in a while. And I helped them hire people. I was helping them build plans from home while I was nursing. Um, and then they actually laid me off. So the person I hired at half my salary replaced me. Oh my God. So while I was on maternity leave, thank God for, you know, government <laughs> benefits. And, and I actually wrote them a really nice letter saying, I, you know, I will, I threatened to sue because it was just not appropriate. What they had done was inappropriate and they were just wanting to pay me two weeks of vacation. So when we talk about inequality, this is, this stuff is happening. This is real. This was, you know, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, so it's still happening to this day. So there is still a very much an inequality when it comes to women and what our bodies can do and what we are. Um, and I'm all for men wanting to stay home and dads wanting to stay home and, and playing a crucial role. But at the end of the day, it's the mother who gives birth and it's the mother who's breastfeeding. If you choose to breastfeed and that is a choice, 
um, and, and having that choice to stay home without being penalized, there's a lot of fear right now, especially in the US. In Canada, thankfully, we have incredible benefits. But in the US, you know, women having to go back after 12 weeks, that's like, I can't even imagine. I, I can't even imagine doing that. I took a year and it wasn't enough. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I keep getting goosebumps here. Um, yeah, that is that that's a great I think that's like at the crux of the problem, right? Is like we we say all these things are important and this, that, and the other, but our behavior is just so contradictory to that reality. Um, yeah. And even I think, you know, my wife and I out of necessity slash randomness built a home daycare, like a little private daycare that we, you know, we have someone who helps us. And just this idea of we haven't, I guess, like, the value of caring for another human being, especially a little kid, is impossible to quantify, I guess. And so in our hyper ma or hyper masculine workplaces or and economy too, which is so predict control, da 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 da, it's almost I don't know, it's just so how do we create this new algorithm in a sense that values these feminine feminine like skills and energies i think that is sort of yeah i remember i don't know i took an economics class in university and there's like that stupid like government industry and what is it society it's like a three thing this is how the economy works it's like oh really okay that's that's so simple yeah i don't know uh so how do we i guess part of our job maybe is to like re I heard Andrew Yang. Do you guys know who Andrew Yang is? He was one of the Democratic nominees who oh, yeah, yeah. fell off early. Yeah. And his, he had a lovely, he was talking to Sam Harris the other day on the podcast and they just, he was just talking about, we just, we have to have a new equation for like what it means to be economically successful, like in, on the national level. Like this GDP equation is just so, Oh, like it's not going to work for us moving forward. And so part of finding a, an equation for this gender balancing or, or et cetera must happen, I guess. I don't know. It's like, man. Yeah. My wife and I are both self-employed too. So when we had the kids, it was just like, and yeah, if my wife chose to do the, the get the money from the government, she would have had to pay into that for the rest of her life. And because she hadn't been paying it. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to go too far down that because I'm not, I don't really know exactly what happened, but okay. So since we're towards the end and I think maybe that's a good place to stop unless you have anything particular you want to add, I want to ask, ask some of these random questions that I had in our email. Are we good for that? Okay. Okay. So we'll start with Michelle. The first question was what type of person were you in high school? I know you kind of talked about it a bit, but if you can expand on that, maybe go for it. So yeah, people in high school didn't know I played the violin or rode a horse. That was kept secret because that was <laughs> nerdy. Violin certainly was nerdy. Um, so I was a swimmer and I, I was kind of, I was a nerd, but in high school, my first boyfriend that I stayed with through all of high school was a soccer player. And so soccer was not, as cool as football, but I was in this soccer kind of crowd. Uh, so swimmer, nerdy soccer crowd. That's my answer. Cool. And what, and where did you go to a public school? I went to a public school in Texas. in yeah. Houston. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Cool. And then, and where did you go to do your undergrad? University of Texas in Austin. Oh, wow. Cool. One of the cool. best cities a, in the world. I think it's a really good yeah, place. Yeah. A I've little, never been. I hear little carve out in Texas of, yeah. of normal <laughs> conscious human beings are there. <laughs> That's pretty cool. All right. Uh, Kareem, can you answer that? Yeah, I was, uh, believe it or not, the outcast. <laughs> I didn't fit in at all. I was bullied throughout high school, uh, made fun of, uh, kept mostly to myself. I was very much an introvert, which is very interesting because I'm more of an ambivert now. And 
leaning towards the extrovert side. So I was very much in my bubble, in my own world. Uh, I was like the poetry writing, nerdy glass wearing, like in the corner, uh, sitting alone at lunch most of the time kind of girl. Um, people don't believe me when I say that. They're like, what happened? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, I came into my, my true self. So it was a lot of uh, releasing a lot of that bullying trauma. But yeah, I was the the bookworm, nerdy, keeping to myself, loner kind of girl <laughs> in high school. Thanks. Such a weird, it's like almost like we're like different things back then, you know? And then, oh man. Um, okay, so Michelle, if we could colonize Mars, would you rather live out your life here or would you rather live out your life on Mars? Okay, so, so that's a big, it depends. So I, I am okay. very close to the space industry because I, I grew up in the part of Houston that is behind mission control. So I literally could see mission control from, from the park in my neighborhood, right? And I grew up with the Challenger astronaut kids. And so when Challenger accident happened, I knew the father of, of Mike Smith, right? And, and so that so space, and then, and then I uh, was also had a job for four years in the space industry in Houston, but selling Russian space technology, declassified Russian space technology. So I knew cosmonauts. I was selling, I was running a, the Soviet space exhibition as it, I was the project manager for that as it traveled the United States. And so the, the Russians have a Marzahod and a Lunahod supposedly, right? Um, and um, uh, those are, we sold mock-ups of the Marzahod in, and had a mock-up of the Marzahod in this exhibition during the US. So I'm really close to that from a standpoint of Mars, right, from that history. <laughs> so, so I would say I'm totally open to space, but it depends on what is happening on Earth at the time. So what is the state of Earth? And, and it also depends who is colonizing Mars. Is it Elon Musk or Donald Trump? I don't know if I want to be with those dudes up there, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I can't answer that until I know a little bit more information, Mike. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. But fair I'm, enough. Open, right. I'm open to the uncertainty okay, okay. around that. <laughs> That's amazing. I gotta, maybe I need a new, reframe that question a bit. But wait, what's a Marzapod or what? A Marzahod. So it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a thing that travels on Mars and picks up samples. You know, it's, a, okay. it's, it's like a dune buggy for Mars. Yeah, cool. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Corinne. <laughs> <laughs> How do I follow that one? Yeah. <laughs> what? What am I going to say to that, Michelle? Me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> weird <laughs> questions bring out weird data you would never learn yeah, otherwise. Yeah, no, 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 no Oh my god. <laughs> Violin. I don't ride horses. I've never been close to Mars like that. <laughs> How do I follow that one, Mike? Tell me, please. <laughs> you can pass. Respond, you can Chris, pass. Or yeah, give it a one. Yeah, no, give a one word answer. Give a one word answer. No, I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna answer. Earth. Okay, I okay, love okay. it here. I'm having the time of my life here, even through the most challenging of times, and it's fun here. And I feel like uh, spiritually, my mission is to to be on Earth right now to help with spreading light around the world and and trying to help people with their pain. So I feel like I belong here right now. Even though I didn't felt, feel like I belonged in high school, I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. <laughs> awesome, thanks. Okay, great. And this question actually, I think personally, I find very fascinating. Uh, so Michelle, what is one thing you think people under 25 or around that age need to learn to help solve the many gro global problems that they'll be tasked with dealing with as they become you know, adults and decision makers in our society? This is a predictable answer for me. Learn how to sense and respond. Just learn how to sense and respond. Sense into but the emerging future, yeah. yeah. Just, just find yeah. the practices that speak to you, learn yeah. how to sense and respond. And if you don't know what that means, you'll, you'll set an intention to, to learn it and you'll find the right, because there's a, a million methods to do it, right? Uh, there's not just yeah. one right way. Yeah. Yeah, just that's my answer. Awesome, thank you. Um, Karen? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, if I could tell my 25 year old self, I would say align <laughs> and center. Align and center, so find 
that center within yourself and, and the balance and know that regardless of what's going on outside of you. So it might be turmoil, it might be chaos. There's always that safe space and that safe haven within yourself and that you can always come home to yourself. And, and there are, like Michelle said, there are many practices. So really finding the tools and the practices that work for you. So for me, it's always been the breath, find your breath. So your breath is sort of the GPS system to bring you home to yourself. Right. So yeah, becoming aware of your emotions, what you're experiencing, not numbing. And then through your practice, finding that center, like your world can be falling apart, but if you're in that centered aligned state, nothing can get to you. You're untouchable. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. It is. That, I think John Kabat-Zinn says it in one of the books. Like, the answers are, what's that uh, saying or analogy? Like, right underneath your nose or whatever? There, there's, like, that saying, yeah, it's right, uh, yeah, right underneath your nose. It's right there. Ah, okay. Well, that was so fun. Uh, Thank you. This was hilarious. Yeah, that was so fun. Yeah, this was good. Not just hilarious. It was really actually, I think, a very well-rounded, deep discussion. Really good. And yeah. Michelle and I are so aligned. It's like, it's great. We're just like... Well, we knew the three of us were aligned, right? From the beginning. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so From different nice angles, way. right? We're so aligned and then everybody's yeah. got their different lens going in and yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank cool you for to be listening with you. to my... Cool to be with you in this social body. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so much fun. Oh my God. Yeah. And likewise, and thanks for uh, allowing me to think out loud and to kind of help clarify my own thoughts and stuff. That's really helpful because it's not easy to, to find people to do that with. So yeah. anytime. You know, you're so good at like navigating like the topic in different ways and looking at it from different angles. Like it was just really, really, yeah, it was great. It was great. Cool. Okay. Well, Till we meet again, which will be on another one of our calls, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Soon. Have a good Sunday. Okay. Thanks. You too. Bye. Cheers. Namaste. Bye. Namaste. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye. Take it easy.